This video is from my course, AWS Step Functions Masterclass. If you're interested in learning more, check out the link in the description section below. Welcome back everyone. In this chapter, we are going to be taking a look at Amazon States language and also workflow management, two important topics that you need to know about if you're working with step functions. So one thing that I wanted to do in this lesson is take a little bit more time to understand what Amazon States language or ASL is, why it's important, and then just show you an example of how it works and how you can use it in real life to solve some problems. So that's the agenda for this video. So let's just jump right into it. And so let's answer the question, what is Amazon States? language. So Amazon States language is the JSON based language or JSON based representation that defines the structure of your workflow. And as part of the ASL definition for a particular workflow, it also includes all of the details about your workflow. So it's essentially a snapshot of its definition at a particular moment in time. So it includes things like tasks to perform, um, the different types, choices, parallel, maps, any other state that you put in there, uh, the sequence of them, so the order that they are run, what points to what, uh, and also all of the input and output manipulation that you'd like to apply to each of the individual states. So it contains the full details of your workflow. So because the ASL is kind of like a snapshot of your workflow at a point in time, it's very useful in two other contexts, which is for source control and for infrastructure as code. So for source control, it's useful because you can take the ASL definition of a workflow and then drop it into your source control. So maybe GitHub or Bitbucket, whatever you're using for source control. And then you can track the changes over time. So people can be modifying it from different projects. You're able to audit it. You're able to do things like code reviews. So have peers take a look at the changes that you're making to your workflow before you push it to production. And it's, so it's very useful in that context. And it's also useful from an infrastructure as code perspective because you can generate ASL via infrastructure as code using a language like CDK or Terraform. There's a bunch of other options that are available to you. And this is very helpful because we're able to also store it in our source control and then directly modify it in our IDE. And so those are two useful applications for ASL. And another useful application is that you're able to go to and from ASL in the Workflow Studio. So using the Workflow Studio, you can use the UI tool to drag and drop. This is basically what we've been doing for the entire duration of this course so far. So you can drag and drop your nodes, you can change the input and the output, you can modify everything there. And then as the output of the Workflow Studio, you can get the ASL definition. You can go and take that and then drop it into source control. So you can validate that it's working in the studio and then add it to a pull request that you send to your peers. Now it also works in the opposite direction. So say for example, your project already exists and you want to pull down the ASL that exists in your version control. You can take that, you can go to Workflow Studio, you can paste in that definition and then instantly you'll have a visual representation in the Workflow Studio. So if you're trying to make a change, then you'll go to the studio, make the change, validate that everything's working. Once it's all validated, you basically repeat the process. You put it into a pull request and then go again from there. And so it's very useful going to and from via the Workflow Studio. And one thing that I wanted to point out here as well is that ASL is important, but it is much less important than it was, I want to say, you know, a year ago or so, basically whenever the Workflow Studio was launched. And the reason I say this is because in the earlier versions of Step Functions, in order to create a workflow, you had to write your own ASL. So you'll see an example of this in the following slide, but it's a very verbose um, very complicated language that's kind of challenging to understand. And there's, you know, there's no autocomplete if it's just a JSON object, right? You have to look up the documentation every time. So it was really, really, I want to say frustrating to work with, but this has gotten immensely better in the past year or so since they launched the Workflow Studio. So you may question if this is useful to learn. I do think it is because there are some cases where, um, say, a new feature gets launched, for example, it may not be available yet in the Workflow Studio because the UI updates haven't been made, but it is available if you define it using your ASL. And so that's one example where, you know, if something's added to step functions, you want to use it right away, then knowing the ASL can work in your favor. 
Okay, so that's a little bit of an introduction to ASL and just covering the broad strokes of it. Let's take a look at a real example now to understand um, kind of the definition and what are the important things to look at. So here's an example of a workflow. We've been working with this particular example a lot in previous lessons, um, and it's a very simple one, but it's enough to illustrate our point and to kind of generate a complex enough ASL that has all the moving parts that we care about. And so to just cover this really quick, it's a very simple one. So there's only three states. Um, so you have an input. This is kind of like an order workflow, similar to what we were doing previously. Um, so the first thing we do is we have a choice state and we're basically looking at the input uh, order type uh, key. And if the order type is equal to purchase, so if order type string equals purchase, then we invoke this Lambda function. And in another case or the default case, it must be a refund. So we take this direction or we take the pass state. Um, so nothing complicated happening here, but let's take a look at the ASL representation of this simple workflow. And so here it is. And you can see it's uh, what one, one to 43. So 43 lines in all of its glory for this simple three state workflow. So let's walk through the important concepts of this ASL document. So I want to start at the top level. So all the top level keys of this object, and you'll see there's only three on line two, three, and four. So comment starts at and states. So comment is, this one doesn't really matter. It's just a uh, description, like you can see of your state machine. You can make this whatever you want. These two are important though. So let's talk about starts at. And starts at does what you may imagine. It points to the name of the state that represents the first node of your workflow. So you can see here, the first node in our workflow, the first state is purchase or refund. So that is the name or the definition of this state. And so this represents the beginning. And if you look inside the states object now, at the top level within that, you have the different states names. So purchase or refund, that's the choice state. And if you look at the siblings of objects on this level, you see purchase handler, and it's right here. So this is our Lambda function. And then all the way at the bottom on line 38 is the refund pass state, which is right over here on the right hand side. And so all of the items that are in the states object at the top level. So the direct children of states are all of the states that exist in your particular workflow. Okay. And so let's run through each of the different ones now, starting with the first one. So the purchase or refund. Um, so you'll see, first of all, that the type is of type choice, and this kind of represents what type of the state it is. And so if it were a parallel state, you'd see parallel here. If it were a past state, like you see down below, it's a past state. Uh, if it were a success or a fail, you'd see the type represented here. And depending on the type of the state, you have different options or different settings that are available to it. So for the choice state in particular, choices allow us to perform branching logic based on the input that comes into our step function. So because of that, we have a choices key inside of this state and inside of it is an array list or a list. And these are all the different conditions that get applied that we want to compare against in our choice state. And so this one is pretty simple. It only has one here, but it actually has two. It's kind of... Um, Kind of a, this one's a little bit tricky because we have the default and the default is just if this doesn't match then we apply the default and so let's take a look at the first choice state first so what is it doing so it's pointing to a variable that says order type and then it's applying the string equals comparison operator and it's looking for the value purchase and so if this is true using this variable and using string equals and purchase then the next state that we want to go to is the purchase handler and so if you look at the visual representation of this over on the left hand side, this makes perfect sense. So we're saying $.order type equals purchase. If this is true, then we go in this direction. And so the next key is an important one. You'll see this in multiple different states, no matter which type it is, this will always tell staff functions what is the next state that we go to. And with a choice state in particular, well, the answer is it kind of depends on which of the choice state is evaluated to be true. And so that's how generally the choices options work within the choices array. And then we also have the default, which is if this isn't true or any of these aren't true, then we just go to whatever is here. And so that's the refund pass. So that's this state over here on the right. 
And so that's how the choices state works. Let's keep on going and take a look at how the lambda function state works. So the lambda function is called the purchase handler and it is of type task. And so we saw in um, the task part of this course, there's different types of tasks. There's you know lambda functions, there's um, activities, there's service integrations, but they all follow kind of the same pattern, I wanna say. And so they have a key called the resource that points to what is the service and what is the API that you want to call. And then for the input and output manipulation, you'll see this, well, it's kind of random, I guess, because is this alphabetical? Uh, it doesn't look alphabetical, but the order, I didn't create this order of the items in this list. It's kind of just pre-generated. Um, so you see the output path, which means that we want to, uh, we want the output to only contain what is inside the payload key. And just skipping down really quick to input path. So we want to filter based on the order type and result path. Remember, this is for combining the input or discarding it. So in this case, since we're referring to a key here with dollar dot original input, we're basically saying put the input to the Lambda function state inside of the result key that's called original input. So that's what this is saying here. And so let's jump back here to the parameters on line 20. So parameters, this should be familiar to you as well. So we're saying we want to pass into our Lambda function um, all of the input from the previous state. That's what this notation tells us here. Here's the function name that we're going to invoke. And then here is the retry policy that we like to apply. So in the case that it's an error equals a Lambda service exception, in that case, we want to wait for two seconds. We want six max attempts and we want to back off by a rate of two or a multiple multiplier of two for every retry. And so that's how the purchase handler or the Lambda function state works. Now, one other important thing on line 34 here, which is this end key. And you can see end is equal to true. And this does what you might expect. So what this indicates to step functions is that any state that has this as true means that it is pointing to the end of the workflow, which makes perfect sense here. If you look at the Lambda function, it is pointing to the end, which is why end is true. And if you also take a look at the refund pass, it is also pointing to the end here, which is why end is true. So you can have end true in any state that you want. Like you can, I suppose you can have that in a choice state. So if a certain choice is true, then go directly to the end. So there's no limitation on this as long as it makes sense for your workflow. And so this is the ASL representation of a workflow. It is pretty verbose and pretty, I guess, tricky to understand. You can imagine what your world may have looked like if you had to write this you know, from scratch, if you wanted to create a workflow, even a simple one like this, it was an absolute disaster. But now that we have the step function workflow studio, this is a lot simpler and a lot less important to know about. But I do think it's useful for you to have an understanding of how it works. So in the next lesson, I'm just going to take you into the AWS console to show you how to import and export ASL, how to generate it, how to look at it and modify it. So I will see you in the next lesson in the console.